extortion, double extortion, banana bread, paella birthday parties, go Cupid. These are just a few things that we learned in Charlie Adelson's trial last fall. Now, today I'm going to go over eight takeaways and how they may come into play in Don Adelson's upcoming trial in the murder of her ex-son-in-law, Dan Markell. Welcome back to La Belle Vie. Today's video is a recap of eight interesting things we learned from Charlie's trial. Now, some items are completely new. Extortion, double extortion. But others were not necessarily new, but we learned more details. And as I mentioned in my content leading up to Charlie's trial, I expected we would see more information because this was the first time that we had an Adelson on trial. And so, therefore, the focus on Charlie's trial was information that relates to the Adelson's alleged involvement in the murder for hire of FSU law professor Dan Markell. Okay, the first takeaway, Charlie is innocent, a.k.a. the extortion, double extortion defense theory. And how could we forget Daniel Rashbaum's puzzle pieces and how this theory shows that the puzzle piece that they're trying to prove, the state's trying to prove that Charlie's that puzzle piece, but extortion, double extortion, shows that Charlie is innocent. So to recap, the defense's theory was that two crimes occurred on July 18th. First, of course, was the brutal murder of Dan Markell. The second crime, however, remember, Rashbaum teased us. He said, the state, the jury, and all of us, we would soon find out what that was. But he likes those cliffhangers. So what we found out was that the second crime that occurred on July 18th was the extortion number one. And that was the night that Charlie was extorted by the killers of Dan Markell. Now, Charlie learns of this extortion from his then-girlfriend, Katie. She comes over to his house that evening and tells him that something terrible has happened and that a friend of hers killed Professor Markell. Now, according to Charlie, Katie said she had nothing to do with it, but she was talking too much about Adelson business, and her friends learned of that million-dollar offer to Dan, so they must have got it in their minds to do this on their own. Now, when Katie was blabbing to her friends, she must have specified that Charlie's portion of that million dollar bribe was a third of a million dollars because that was the amount he was extorted. But why didn't the extorters just go after the full million dollars if they knew that Adelson's had the money and were willing to pay Dan for it? Anyway, Charlie learns if he doesn't pay the third of a million dollars in the next 48 hours, he's going to be next. So Charlie went to his safe and he mounted his money and he had $138,000 in cash. Now, Katie went outside and talked with the extorters who agreed that Charlie could pay $3,000 a month since he didn't have that full $333,000. But that $3,000 amount doesn't go towards the principal. He's still going to have to pay off the, the balance, but it's just going to basically allow him to be on a payment plan to give him some time. We also learned that the subsequent checks from the Adelson Institute were meant to account for $1,000 of that $3,000 monthly payment to the extorters. But the 1000 was still going to the extorters. It's just that Charlie was going to give it to Katie on a payroll check so she could get some health insurance for her kids. Now, Katie would simply cash the Adelson Institute checks and still give that $3,000 amount to the extorter, you know, the $1,000 from the checks and the $2,000 from the cash that Charlie was paying each month. And so, of course, this also gives an explanation of why Donna had to be told about the extortion just two months after Dan's murder, because that's why Donna, who's the Adelson Institute's office manager, was writing those checks. Now, to provide an explanation of the bump and the corresponding wiretaps in April and May of 2016, the defense called this the second extortion. 
And so all of that talking on the wiretaps, which is not code, it's just careful talking, that's them talking about the second extortion. Now, they're happy if it's the police, because then none of them gonna get, is going to get killed. But if it's a bad guy, they are in danger. Now, obviously, the jury presumably didn't buy this extortion, double extortion theory. And as far as Donna's upcoming trial, of course, we don't know yet what the defense's theory is going to be. But just going off the interview that Daniel Rashbaum had recently with STS, it appears that at least right now, they're going to stick to this extortion, double extortion theory, but they're going to modify it for Donna's case. So the argument's probably going to be something along the lines of, you don't have to necessarily believe that Charlie story that he was actually extorted the night of Dan's murder is true. You just have to believe that Donna believed it was true and she wanted to protect her son. And so that's why, you know, she was involved with the bump conversations. And that also explains why she's the one writing those Adelson Institute checks. It's a mother's love to protect her son. Okay. So the second new thing we learned at Charlie's trial was Donna's banana bread. Now, this came from Wendy's testimony on direct examination, and it came up in the context of Dan Markell's March 26, 2014 counter motion to enforce the marital settlement agreement on parenting issues. And as part of that grandma motion, Dan was alleging that Donna was disparaging him in the presence of the children, including allegations that the children told Dan that Donna says he's stupid, he's trying to take away her sunshines away, and that Donna hates him. And this, of course, was all leading to potential parental alienation, according to Dan's motion. Now, Wendy testified that Donna never saw the grandma motion. And a few days later, Dan asked her parents to babysit the kids. And Donna even baked him banana bread and gave him a hug. Did your mother, Donna Adelson, re review the uh, filing in which Dan Markella is accusing you of the theft and all this stuff. I don't remember if she did. What about the one where Dan Markell is asking that your mother not be permitted to have unsupervised visitation with the kids? My mom never saw that because after he filed that, he then asked my parents to babysit the kids. My mom baked him banana bread, gave him a hug goodbye. So there was nothing truthful about that pleading that he filed and my mom never saw it. Why do you think he filed that? He was really angry at me for leaving him. Okay, so he didn't really want to limit your mom's visitation with the kids. No. And he that's evidence. Baby said after he filed that. Evidence by the banana bread. And, and so she didn't even know about that filing. She never knew about it. Okay. During another portion of Wendy's testimony, Georgia raises the grandma motion again. And Georgia asks Wendy, was it fair to say that your mom was worried about that motion? Wendy said again, no, my mom never knew about this motion. And again, Danny had asked her mom to babysit the kids after the motion was filed. So she doesn't really believe that Danny wanted to keep Donna away from the kids. So this is when Georgia came back and showed that Wendy had forwarded the grandma motion to 12 people, including Donna, of course, Jeffrey Lacasse, her best friend Tova, Gary Cohen, that lawyer in South Florida. Robert Adelson, and some others. Georgia asked Wendy, if she wasn't worried about the motion, why did you forward to all those people? She said she couldn't really say. It's been a long time. Isn't it in this motion that Dan Markell seeks to enjoin you from allowing your mother from spending time with the kids without supervision? Can you please show me which page that's on? 450. Do you see a paragraph beginning on three specific occasions? Yes, I do. Could you read that, please? 8A, on three specific occasions in November 2013, the children informed Mr. Markell, Abba, Dad, Grandma says you're stupid. When, when queried as to why grandma, the maternal grandmother, would say such things, the children replied jointly that it is because she says you are trying to take her sunshines away from her. Continue, please. In December 2013, 
You don't have to say the name. Yeah. Your child. My child, the younger son, further stated to Mr. Markell in front of the former wife, Abba, Grandma says she hates you. The children were visiting with their grandparents at that time. Mr. Markell is concerned that continued exposure to such negativity forms a foundation for parental alienation. Is that what he was alleging about your mom? That is what he is alleging in this document, yes. And this was filed in court. He filed this in court. On what date? Um, it will be at the front of the document, right? Yes, ma'am. Page 441. <clears throat> this was filed on March 26th, 2014. And this was the filing that never got ruled on, right? I don't believe there was any ruling on this. And that's because Dan Markell was killed before the hearing, right? I don't know when it was scheduled for. It wasn't even scheduled yet. Okay. It was waiting to be scheduled when he was killed. If, if, is it fair to say your mom was worried about this motion? No, my mom never knew about this motion. And as I mentioned before, Danny asked my mom to babysit after filing this motion. So I don't really believe anything that's written here. Well, you forwarded this motion to your mother. I don't believe via I did. email. In fact, you forwarded this motion to 12 different people. Your mom, Jeffrey Lacoste, Renee Griggs, Tova Walsh, Morgan Honeycutt, Gary Cohen, Miguel Edmondson, Trey Hubler, Robert Adelson, Rachel Frank, Jared Reich, and some M-E-H-U-L-N-Y-C at yahoo.com. So if you weren't worried about this, why'd you send it to all these people? I couldn't really say. It's been a long time. And then a couple days later, we know what happened. So this was in March. So a couple days, I filed it. I sent it to people in July when Danny you was killed. You sent it, I'm sorry, you sent it a couple days later. I sent the, I that sent email to 12 different people. In March. Yes. Maybe you first now, for Donna's trial, the grandma motion will definitely come up. Whether we hear again about this banana bread, I don't know. Um, I personally think it's somewhat ludicrous. And I'm not sure that the defense is going to want to serve that up again for the prosecution to use. The next item we learned about in Charlie's trial was how important Halloween 2013 was. Halloween 2013 was a busy time for the Adelson family. And we had a few things going on this day. Now, Donna and Harvey were apparently out of the country. I believe they were in Israel, which we see from the text between Charlie and Donna. Now, the texts actually begin oct on October 30 and continue on through October 31st. And I'll show these now. And these are the texts about convincing Wendy to pull out of buying a house in Tallahassee. Now, Wendy did wind up backing out of buying the house on this day, and this was the same day that her attorney filed the motion to enforce the marital settlement agreement and for contempt. Now, what's interesting is that during Wendy's direct examination, Georgia asked Wendy about some emails on the topic of pulling out of the house, implying that Wendy was upset, that she couldn't answer the phone, she's crying too much about the house. Now, we didn't get to actually see the emails themselves. They were just used for identification purposes, unfortunately. And Wendy, to all that, said she didn't remember that. This was filed on October 31st, 2013. All right, so Halloween of 13, and that's the same day that you backed out of the contract to purchase the house in Tallahassee, right? I don't remember, remember that? what day that was. Okay. Do you remember that it was your brother, Charlie, that specifically convinced you to back out of that particular house deal? I don't, actually. I don't remember that. These text messages refresh your recollection. Okay. And you may have to look around for context, but I'm specifically looking at this one. Okay.
Okay. Does that refresh your recollection? Honestly, I mean, I can read what's here, but I still don't remember. Don't really remember. And after pulling the plug on the house, there were some emails where you were saying you can't answer the phone, you're crying too hard about the house. Like you seem genuinely upset about pulling the plug on the house, but now you don't remember it? Well, it's been 10 years. Sure. So a lot of terrible things have happened since then. It's hard to remember. Um, don't I, recall. I really yeah. liked the house and was excited about it, but it was more than I can afford at the time. That's what I remember is talking with the real estate agent and having her say we would just, we'd find another house and it wasn't right the, the right one. Would you have any reason to dispute that that occurred on Halloween of 2013? No, I'm, it probably did. I just, I just don't remember. Also on Halloween, Charlie was a busy guy. After being a miracle worker and talking Wendy out of buying that house and making the second dumbest mistake of her life, Charlie had a Halloween date with his new gal, Katie. Now, Katie testified they were going to a Halloween party on Lincoln Road. And if you've seen any of my traveling periodontist tours, I've filmed Lincoln Road a couple of times. It's an acute area. So anyway, Katie said that when she and Charlie got in the car, Charlie asked her if she knew anyone that could harm someone. And she said yes. Now, Katie said that she had Sigfredo in mind, but she didn't give Charlie a name. Now, the conversation didn't go further that night, and she was not aware at that time of who Charlie allegedly wanted to rough up. Yeah, to kill Dan Markell. Charlie. So, Sigfredo Garcia didn't come up with the idea? No, ma'am, he did not. Luis Rivera didn't come up with the idea? No, ma'am, he did not. When did the defendant first bring this idea up to you? My first recollection was around Halloween of 2013. Around Halloween or on that? On, cool? on Halloween, yes ma'am. All right, what, what, what's your recollection of how that came up? Um, we were at a Halloween party in Lincoln Road and right before we were about to go, he got in the car with me and he asked me a question. What was the question? Do you know anybody that can harm someone? And did you know anybody that could harm someone? Yes, ma'am, I did. Who was that? Sigfredo. And at the time, what was your relationship with Sigfredo? It wasn't the best. But he was the father of your children, right? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So were you dating both men at this time, or were you only dating no, Charlie? No, I was only dating Charlie. Okay. And so he initially... He, meaning the defendant, initially said, do you know anyone that could harm someone? Was he aware of your connection to Zigfredo Garcia when he made not, that statement? Not that I know of. No, ma'am. Did you suggest Zigfredo Garcia at that time to the defendant? No, ma'am. What I, did you say? I just said yes and kind of left it alone. All right. Did it go any further than that at that time? Not at that. Not that night. Right. Did really you so. know who he wanted harmed Did at that time? No, ma'am. Now, I think all of this will come in during Donna's trial. Certainly the text uh, about Donna and Harvey being thankful, you know, calling Charlie a miracle worker for getting Wendy to pull out of buying a house in Tallahassee, that will come in. Now, why was that so important? Doesn't it make sense rather that Wendy would put down roots in Tallahassee since the family law judge in June had denied her motion to relocate with prejudice? Didn't Wendy testify that she was content in staying in Tallahassee and that she had accepted that that was her life for then? So why wouldn't she want to buy a house? I think the Charlie and Katie conversation will come in as well, as that's the state's theory of when the ball started to be put in motion to deal with the Dan Markell problem. Okay, the fourth new information we learned in Charlie's trial was Harvey's 70th birthday paella party. Now, we know that Harvey had a 70th birthday party on Saturday, July 5th, 2014, and we knew from prior trials that Wendy was in South Florida partly because it was her father's 70th birthday, and you recall that was those two weeks just before Dan Markell was murdered. But Charlie's trial gave us more on this party. So first we have the text between Charlie and Donna, and we hadn't seen these before. 
Now, the first one I'm showing is on March 4th, 2014, and that's when Donna mentions Harvey's birthday gift. This is where Donna tells Charlie that they're going to stop in Gainesville for a bathroom break. And by the way, I assume that this is either them coming or going from Tallahassee. And that Donna will talk to him then, but he needs to erase the text. Now, the state's theory is that they're moving forward with their planning now on the murder for hire. And to put these texts in the timeline, this is just a couple of weeks after Dan filed his first counter motion to enforce the marital settlement agreement. And remember, that one was on financial issues, and that was also for sanctions. That was filed on February 14th, 2014. And we know from these texts between Donna and Charlie that the next day after Dan filed that motion, that Wendy and Donna were quite upset about it. We know also that Donna was in town for the court hearing that would take place that following Monday, as we see here. And then a couple of days later, here we have Donna's text to Charlie about Wendy being upset that Dan wanted to spend some extra time with his kids after soccer. And then we have this email from Donna to Wendy the next day about her case strategy, where Donna has apparently started referring to Dan as Elvis. So things were amping up. And then, of course, we have Dan's grandma motion on March 26. Now, here we have another new text between Donna and Charlie on June 7th, 2014. So this was after the June 4th through 5th trip, first trip that Sigfredo and Lewis took to Tallahassee to either scope things out or attempt to murder Dan. I don't know that we've ever been quite clarified on that point. But in any event, this is after right after that. And again, Charlie says he's still working on Harvey's birthday present. And Donna says she knows Charlie will come through. And again, the state's theory is that this birthday present is code talk for the murder for hire. Now, in contrast, Charlie says this is just all about paella catering, which was his birthday present for Harvey. Now, also around the time of Harvey's big birthday bash, we have this new text from Wendy to Dan. I'm inserting it here. This was on Sunday, July 6, 2014, so the morning after Harvey's birthday party. Wendy asks Dan if he is in Tallahassee July 14 to 18. I just want to know if I can have the kiddos on the 16. Thanks. And Dan replies minutes later, yes, you can. Now, as I mentioned before in prior videos, this text is important because it shows Wendy is confirming that Dan will physically be in Tallahassee the week of the murder. She knew he had the kids that week. They were in summer schedule, which they had under their MSA. It was one week on and one week off. And the parent that didn't have the kids for that week was entitled to have them on a Wednesday night if the custodial parent was in town. So Dan could have been out of town that week he had the kids. Just like Wendy had been out of town for the two weeks during her South Florida Harvey birthday trip. And he didn't. Dan didn't get to see the kids on those Wednesday nights. So Wendy knew that she would, you know, she would be able to see the kids on the 16th if Dan was physically present. So she says, I just want to know if I can have the kiddos on the 16th. July 16 was a Wednesday, which would have been her night to have the kids if he was in town. It's a smart way of asking, are you going to physically be in Tallahassee without coming right out and saying it? Smart. I think all of these items are going to be included in Donna's trial, and I'm, I'm wondering if we won't see some additional ones. Okay, fifth takeaway when we learned from Charlie's trial was, okay, Cupid. So we learned for the first time during Charlie's trial that Ms. Wendy was on OkCupid, which is an online dating site, and she was on OkCupid during the time that she was supposedly seriously dating Jeffrey Lacasse. Now, in Rashbaum's cross-examination of Wendy, he indicates that after Wendy broke up with Jeff, she joined some dating websites. Rashbaum brought this up to suggest that Wendy was happy being in Tallahassee. She was making new dates. She was making plans with all these other people, right? So that was what he's trying to emphasize, that of course she was happy in Tallahassee and she had no motive to leave. 
She was making plans. Rashbaum even cited some of these dates, which was kind of funny because I'm not sure that made her look so good. He said she set up dates for the week of July 18th. She set up a date on July 16th for two weeks later. Then on July 17th, she set up another date for two weeks later. Wow, Wendy was setting up a lot of dates on OK Cupid. And after you broke up with him, do you recall joining a, a date, couple of date sites, uh, I websites? Did. I don't know if they're called date sites, but dating websites. Yes. Okay. Uh, do you recall uh, setting up dates for the week or so after July 18th? I did. And do you recall having emails with individuals setting up those dates? I do. Do you recall setting up those dates? On July 16th, 2014, for two weeks later. That sounds right. Do you recall setting up dates on July 17th for around two weeks later? That sounds right. Wendy really wanted to make sure that she had lots of documentation for plans in Tallahassee after July 18th, the day of Dan's murder. Now, in Georgia's redirect, she asked Wendy this. You were asked about Jeffrey Lacoste and the way that your relationship ended. What is OkCupid? Okay OkCupid okay is a dating website. Were you on that dating website? I was. Were you on that dating website at the time that you were dating Mr. Lacoste? No, I wasn't. And were you speaking? So I guess if you weren't on it, you weren't speaking to multiple men from the website during the time you were dating Mr. O'Klaas. And I'll remind you that you provided your phone in this case and it was celebrated, downloaded. Just argument for disregard the last comment from the prosecutor. Go ahead. Didn't you just say that you weren't on OkCupid at the time that you were dating Jeffrey Lacoste? I don't know when we say I officially stopped dating Jeff Lacaz, but there's a chance that, I mean, I, I don't remember in 2014 whether I had gotten the app and started talking to people before we officially broke up. Okay, so my point is there's a chance that he was right. You were being unfaithful or at least talking to other people. He had a reason to be jealous. I think he had some serious jealousy issues that may or may not have been founded. Yeah, I think we got from your testimony that you believe he had serious jealousy issues. My question to you is, did he have a reason to be? No. So he was wrong. He was wrong in June when he accused me of being with multiple people that I wasn't with. Yes. Okay. Now, this is all isn't terribly important for Donna's case specifically, but it is helpful to show Wendy's credibility or not when she's on the stand. And it's also to juxtapose the testimony of Jeffrey Lacasse, who is an important witness for the state. I anticipate that the state will call Wendy for Donna's trial, so we may say, OK, Cupid, come up again. OK, number six, the Geek Squad and the Broken TV. Now, of course, the Geek Squad and the Broken TV are not anything new. We've known about that for all the trials. But we did learn two new things in Charlie's trial about these two items. First, it was confirmed that Donna made that Geek Squad appointment, and it was made on one week before Dan's murder on Friday, July 11th. And that was the weekend when Harvey and Donna were in town because they had driven Wendy back up to Tallahassee from that two-week birthday trip, and she had, they had driven Wendy and the boys back to town. So I think this will definitely come up in Donna's trial because it's because she's the one that made this alibi appointment. We also learned from Jeff Lacasse that this TV was broken way before July, and that this TV was broken way back in some time between the June 11th through 18th time period to Jeff's best recollection. And he recalls that he had rented a movie that week um, about a dragon for the boys to watch, and that when he came over to our house, he saw that the TV was broken, and um, it looked like it had been struck by an object and was unusable. He said it looked like a fist hit it and it had like a shattered mark on it. 
Now, he also testified that there was a TV in the back bedroom, but for Wendy, for whatever reason, didn't want to watch the movie on that TV, so they wound up having to watch this movie on the broken TV. And Jeff said the kids were upset. He he didn't understand why we're making these children watch this TV, this movie on a broken TV. And he's like, it's not covered by warranty. And you know, it wasn't even like it was a fancy TV, even described it like something you'd find in a dorm room. So let's go forward a little bit to this TV situation. Do you know anything about Wendy's TV being broken? I do. And when was the TV broken, if you know? Between June 11th and 18th, I think it's closer to the 11th, but 100% in that week. And how do you know it was in that week? Because we rented a movie, How to Train a Dragon 2, to give the kids a special movie night. And I have text messages where I'm discussing having seen the movie by the 18th with friends. So you were able to refresh your memory? Yeah, I was able to refresh my memory. All right, so do you get the movie or? Well, it's back in the day. It was Redbox. So I rented a DVD from a Redbox. It was 2014. All right, and go over there with the movie, and what happens when you arrive? I walk in the door, and uh, Miss Adelson asks me to look at her television because there's something wrong with the television. And what was wrong with the television? Well, I turned it on, and I was immediately confused because it really shouldn't have been a question. As soon as you turn the TV on, it's been struck by an object and is damaged and basically unusable. Can you explain what the damage looked like? Yeah, it looked like somebody stood in front of it, took their fist, and hit it like that was my first impression. So um, kind of like a shatter mark with spiders. Yeah, there's like an impact crater, and then there's, uh, out from that, there's, and it's all pixelated and distorted, which makes it very difficult, or really no one would watch this TV unless you, know, you had to. And I, I had second thoughts about that. I looked around the room. Maybe the kids broke it. So I looked all around the room, and I, it didn't seem plausible that the children broke it. They're very small. This object had to be kind of heavy. I'd thrown a ball around with them. I just couldn't see how the kids could have could have done it. But you um, didn't see how it got busted. I didn't see it. I didn't know for sure. And I didn't know we'd be discussing this in a murder trial. So I didn't like investigate further or think about it very much, to be honest with you. I just thought, okay. Uh, Were there other TVs in the house? There was a TV in the back bedroom, a similar make and model that we had watched television with the kids before on that TV before. So, yes. Is that where you watched the movie that night? No, I went to go uh, hook up the DVD player in the back room. Miss Adelson insisted that it would not work and actually stopped me from even trying. So I um, thought that was very odd, but I didn't want to argue. And it's her house, her TV, her kids. So I said, okay. So did you watch the movie on the broken TV? Yeah, we, we gave the kids movie night where we watched a movie on a broken television that was distorted enough that you could follow what was happening. But the kids are whining and crying the whole time. And I wasn't whining or crying exactly, <laughs> but... I was tempted to because it was Close. it was pretty frustrating, um, and I just didn't understand, uh, you know, what was was going on. And of course, I had related that this TV is broken; it's unwatchable; it's not covered by warranty. You're gonna have to get a new TV, and I offered to go do that for her anytime she wanted. She's a busy single mom. I'll run by Best Buy, get you a new TV. It was not like a eighty-inch TV or something that was really that luxurious it was a tv like you'd see in a dorm room so we could have replaced it right away all right did you end up getting a new tv no she turned me down several times on that offer and i again it's her house i tried to respect her boundaries and i said oh okay but it was inconvenient because after dinner you know, it's nice to be able to put the kids in front of that tv while you clean up the dishes and stuff and okay. it just sat there being an inconvenience for a while So I wonder if we'll hear more about this in Donna's trial. What was the hesitation of using the TV in the back room? Had it been packed up? Who knows? Okay, the seventh new item we learned from Charlie's trial was a new witness, and that was Stephen Webster, who was Dan's lawyer at the time of his murder. Now, I thought Stephen's testimony was really critical on motive. First, it was nice to hear from a witness that knew Dan and could tell his side of the story, particularly on the post-divorce litigation. I think he comes across as extremely credible. 
And he gave a measured response. I mean, he said when he first was retained by Dan, he had to manage some expectations and give him advice where some of the things Dan was asking for, like kissing the boys goodnight when they were at Wendy's. He's like, that's, you're never going to get that. Like, let's, let's focus on what's really important. And what Dan told Stephen was what he was really concerned about was parental alienation because of Donna. Stephen testified that Dan was concerned that Donna was trying to drive a wedge between him and his children. And Stephen also testified that Dan heard Donna call Dan stupid on a Skype call recently after he filed the grandma motion. And that made Dan livid. He wanted to get more time with his children, if at all possible, but he didn't want to change the kind of the time sharing. He had a kind of an unusual request. Um, he wanted to see if there was any way that he could see the children every night when he didn't have them to tuck them into bed and kiss them goodnight. And he said, look, I'll only stay five minutes. I promise I won't bother anybody and I'll leave. And I said, Dan, that's probably never going to happen. That's just probably not reasonable. Um, and then he was really concerned about parental alienation, uh, which at the time I wasn't you know, really familiar with it. I didn't do family law, but I was familiar with it from the perspective of I learned about it in law school and stuff like that. Um, but he was really concerned that the grandmother, um, Donna Adelson, was really trying to drive a wedge between him and the children. And he actually told me that he heard her refer to him as stupid on a Skype call. Um, he couldn't see her in the Skype uh, screen, but he heard her say something to the effect of stupid's on the phone. And he was livid about it. And he was ready to basically kind of go to war over that. Um, that sort of reference, the filing that we're familiar with where grandma says you're stupid and he was seeking to have grandma enjoined from having unsupervised contact with the kids. Yeah. And I, I, I didn't have the opportunity to actually talk to him about that yet because he was killed. Um, but it was my understanding that after that filing, he heard her. Actually, okay. he heard her because that's what he told me. He said, I heard her call me stupid, um, and but she wasn't in the screen, but he knew her voice. And so he was very upset about that. And Stephen's testimony was also important to demonstrate that not all things were copacetic between Dan and Wendy and Dan and the Adelsons at the time of his murder. We've heard some testimony that everything was going well between Dan Markell and Wendy in the few weeks leading up to his death. Do you have any knowledge of that fact? It's, it's untrue. There's a reason he hired me. He didn't retain me because he needed a friend. <laughs> Tor basically told me on the, on the phone call, he said, look, there's going to be a trial and it's going to be acrimonious. And he needs a lawyer that can go into the courtroom and be prepared to fight. He said, that's why I think you could handle this case. And that was, we were heading towards a trial. And he certainly, um, you know, I mean, he sent me an email the day before um, talking about how he was irate because Wendy, unbeknownst to him, had actually enrolled or applied to have been enrolled at the School of Arts and Sciences. And she didn't even talk to Dan about it. So he found out the day before when he got called from the school saying that Ben had been accepted. And so he emailed me and said, I'm irate about this. He said, you know, I don't think it's appropriate. Okay. So, no, I mean. So there were a bunch of issues still going on. Yes. It was hot at the time. Yes. All right. And the banana bread didn't make things better. Stephen's testimony also counters the defense's theory that all these motions were no big deal. No one took them seriously. He said he wouldn't have gotten involved if these were a losing situation. And he said seeking contempt is a big deal. And he felt that she could have potentially been held in contempt because she didn't disclose things on her family law financial affidavit. And there was some suggestion that Dan Markell was expected to lose all the filings that were currently pending at the time of his death and Wendy was expected to prevail on everything. Do you agree with that assessment? You mean like with the contempt and all of that? Yeah. No, I mean, I wouldn't have, I would not have got involved if I thought he was going to lose on the contempt. You know, I, 
my reputation travels with my clients too if they're doing things like that right i mean if you're representing a client who is disrespecting the court you know it it's hard not to feel like that's bleeding off on you and you're disrespecting the court and in tallahassee florida if you practice in this circuit you know if i disrespect judge everett today you know every judge in this circuit that matters to me is going to know about it before lunch tomorrow <laughs> And it's just, no. So, no, I would not have accepted. That's why I didn't think I was going to take the case when I read all that. Seeking contempt is kind of a big deal amongst lawyers, right? Yes. I mean, you know, contempt is, you know, it's an ugly, th it's, you know, it's a very ugly kind of prospect. And as a lawyer, that was one of my main concerns is, you know, she was a lawyer. And I did feel like she should be held in contempt. She didn't disclose things on her financial affidavit. Dan convinced me of that. And... But that was to be determined, right? But in By my, court. Yes. But in my mind, yes. that was the only reason I took it. Okay. And, you know, at the end of the day, you can lose your law license for that. You know, I mean, you would, I guess you would have to report that to the bar. I, I didn't research it, but the court would refer it to the bar. If the court found you were in contempt, the court would refer it to the bar and, you know, you could lose your law license. So, yeah, it's pretty serious, you know, in that regard. I think Stephen is a really important interest for the state to counter everything that Wendy said about everything being fine. Dan was cool with Donna. Donna's making him banana bread. And then therefore the Adelsons would have no motive to be involved with Dan's murder. Okay. So the last new thing we learned in Charlie's trial was moldy money. So not only do the Adelsons staple their money, they apparently wash it, but it gets moldy. Katie testified that the money she received from Charlie the morning after Dan's murder was in a plastic Ziploc bag that was in a brown bag and then it had a grocery bag over it. It was stapled, but she also said that money was damp and there was mold on it. I'll insert her testimony here. How was the money packaged when you got it? I think you said you got it the next morning. Yes, ma'am. Okay, it how was, was it packaged? It was in, um, it was in a plastic bag. The money was in a plastic bag, like a Ziploc bag that was inside a brown bag and then like a grocery bag over it. And was the money stapled? Yes, ma'am, it was. Can you explain how it was stapled? Like what size bills and what increments were stapled together? Uh, I believe it was stapled in. I never counted it, but it was like in a stack and it was stapled in the corner. Right. Were they $100 bills or something else? They were $100 bills and there was some 20s and 50s. Okay. And was the money damp? Yes, ma'am, it was. Explain what, what you mean to the jury. Um, a couple days after that, um, I went and I opened the bag and I called Sigfredo and I told him, I was like, there's mold on this money. And he's like, well, blow dry it. And I was like, but why would there be mold on the money? And he's just, I don't know, just blow dry it. Look, Katie is a frustrating witness. Many of us believe she's holding out, and I don't know what's up with that. But I thought that this testimony came across very credible. I mean, you can imagine Katie calling Sigfredo and saying, what's up with this money? It's damp and it's got mold on it. And you can totally see Sigfredo being pragmatic and saying, just blow dry it. <laughs> Katie also testifies that she thinks his parents, and particularly his mother, may have washed the money. Now, because he said he didn't have any money in his house, he always told her that. He did, that Katie testified that Charlie told her that his parents had stopped by before she got there that evening. And then, of course, he had money when she arrived. So she deduced that the parents dropped it off. And then he put the money in her trunk the next morning, and it was already packaged and, store and sorted. So this suggests that Donna and Harvey dropped off the money, which is new information. I believe his parents or his mom might have washed the, the money. You mean like physically washed the money? Yes, ma'am. And why do you think his mom did it? Because he, oh, he was always adamant about telling me he didn't have any money in his house. And he told me that his parents had just stopped by right before I got there. Okay. So all of a sudden he had money to put in my in the trunk of my car. The was following the morning. money I'm sorry, I interrupted you. I'm sorry. Was the money already sorted out and packaged when you first saw it or was he doing that? No, it was already stacked and sorted out. Okay. 
and did he have to so he didn't have to go anywhere to get the money he already had it when you arrived yes ma'am and related to that, we also have Sergeant Corbett's testimony about Donna and Harvey being near Charlie's house the evening of July 18th. Now, who arrived at Charlie Adelson's residence during the time when Magbanwa was still consistent with Rivera's residence? Uh, Donna and Harvey Adelson. Okay. Objection. What was the objection? Foundation. Approach. I could rephrase my question, Judge, too. Would that be all right? Okay. Go ahead and do that. Was there some evidence in the iCloud um, involving messages between Donna Adelson and Charlie Adelson where she says she is at his house on the evening of July 18th during a time when Catherine McBanua is still more consistent with Rivera's house? Yes. Okay. Can you show us that message? I can. Okay, so Donna Adelson here says, call us ASAP at 7.12 p.m.? Yes. And then at 8.59 p.m., she says, outside your house? Yes. And Charlie Adelson says, 10 minutes at 9.19? Correct. Okay. Ten, about 10 minutes from when he sent that text message, so maybe about 9.30 p.m., is that when he's consistent with being at his house? Yes. And according to this message, his mother is already there? That's correct. All right. Does Charlie Adelson stay at his house that evening? He does, yes. Okay. So you, the location we saw before, he was still there at 11.39 p.m.? That's correct. All right. Home. On cross-examination, Sergeant Corbett admitted that he didn't analyze Don and Harvey's phones and the cell towers in detail regarding their trip to Orlando, but he could do that. Now, the question he moved on from that, but it looks like Sergeant Corbett and his team went back and did that work because Donna's arrest warrant states that cellular records for Donna Adelson and Harvey Adelson show an arrival time of 1.25 a.m. in Orlando, Florida, leaving an approximate hour and a half time block consistent with Donna being at Charlie's residence that evening during the alleged moldy money drop off. So we'll definitely see more analysis from Sergeant Corbett's team and Donna's trial, both from, I think, information they've had all along. It's just that they keep bringing it out as each new person comes to trial and where information is relevant to that defendant. So I think we're going to see stuff that we haven't seen before from the initial investigation. I also suspect we're going to get information from the devices that they have seized in connection with Donna's arrest. We've got Donna's cell phone. We've got Harvey's cell phone. We've got another cell phone from that Harvey's and Donna's residence. We've got an iPad and we've got two MacBook Pros. I'm sure that Sergeant Corbett and his team are working very diligently analyzing those devices. So there you go. Those are just eight items that were new to me and Charlie's trial. Uh, let me know in the comments below if there's any other items that, that came out in Charlie's trial that you took note of. I think, as I mentioned, I think we'll probably see most, if not all of these, come up in Donna's upcoming trial, as well as, of course, new information that we haven't seen before. But thank you so much again for joining. If you haven't already, if you would consider subscribing, I'm really trying to grow the channel, and consider liking. That does help the algorithm. In the meantime, I hope to see you in my next one. Bye. Thanks again for joining, everyone. I hope you're having a beautiful weekend. Hope to see you soon.